Kia ora, welcome to this Goodfellow Unit webinar tonight. We're speaking on bowel cancer with Professor Ian Bissett, who's a general and colorectal surgeon and chair of the New Zealand National Bowel Cancer Working Group. And without further ado, we'll start with Ian. Thank you, Ian. Kia ora and thank you. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you about bowel cancer. Bowel cancer is the second most common cause of death in men and women in New Zealand. And unfortunately, New Zealand has one of the highest incidences globally of, of bowel cancer. So I think it's a really important topic for us to come to grips with tonight. What I'm going to do is to look at the different ways in which bowel can cancer presents as an acute problem with symptoms during surveillance of patients and more recently with screening. So I'll try and cover all of those over the next hour or so. But we're better to start when I'm talking to general practitioners than with prevention. There are some things that have been shown in epidemiological studies to lower your risk of bowel cancer. I've got a list of them here. Having a healthy diet with adequate fiber and not too much processed or red meat, plenty of fruit and vegetables, normal healthy diet. Exercise interestingly, reduces the risk of bowel cancer, and even for those with bowel cancer, improves their survival for those who've been through treatment. Alcohol and smoking both probably equally are um, in, associated with, with developing bowel cancer. And interesting, some epi epidemiological studies have shown that aspirin is protective, at least to some degree, in reducing the incidence of bowel cancer. I'm going to start with Case. This is actually a patient who's a friend of mine. He's 34 years old and he's been living in UK for the last three years. He's a musician who makes his living as a coffee roaster. In about April of this year, he started noticing a small amount of bright red bleeding. It was just on the paper. It didn't seem to be a problem. After a month or two, he developed intermittent left-sided abdominal pain. This was colicky in nature sometimes. And as time went on, he noticed that there was sort of sounds from his stomach when he had the pain. He then developed acute abdominal pain in August of this year. Uh, the pain was severe and constant, and he was hot and sweaty. He went to his doctor who referred him to hospital. His past history was pretty unremarkable. It had no previous surgery, previously been well, a non-smoker, low alcohol intake, no family history of bowel cancer. But when he was examined, he was febrile, tachycardic. He was tender with rebound on the left side of his abdomen. And there was a vague impression that he might have a mass. So they gave him intravenous fluids, put him through the CT scanner, and this showed an area on the left side of his, uh, his colon where the bowel was thickened. There was some extra luminal fluid and air. It looked like he had acute diverticulitis with a perforation. So he was started on intravenous antibiotics, continued with IV fluids, Mill by mouth, his temperature and pain settled. He got back onto a normal diet and he was discharged. A month later, he had a similar attack, which again settled. He didn't require admission for that one. Then in September, he got increasing pain, anorexia, weight loss, and his friends said he looked absolutely terrible. He was readmitted to hospital and rescanned, and this showed that he had an increased size in the mass on the left side of his abdomen and a perforation going into the abdominal wall. There was nothing to see in the rest of his abdomen nor in his lungs. So he had antibiotics overnight, intravenous fluids, and the following morning he had a major laparotomy. There was a tumor in the descending colon. It had perforated into the left abdominal wall and two loops of small bowel were also stuck on that. So he had a major resection, resection of the left colon, 
two loops of small bowel, and a covering ileostomy. The histology came back as a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, T4, meaning it had invaded something else, N2, there were 14 lymph nodes identified, all were involved with cancer. And unfortunately, the resection margin in the abdominal wall was positive for tumour. He's just arrived back in New Zealand. He's about to start on chemotherapy. But the likelihood of him being cured from this disease is relatively small. I want to talk a little bit about acute presentation with bowel cancer. New Zealand has a 26% present, uh, emergency presentation rate for colorectal cancer. That means uh, more than a quarter of patients with bowel cancer will discover this after an admission through the emergency department. Not all of them have an acute problem. Some present there with symptoms that are not as acute, but the, it is not an even playing field for this. And the most common are patients who are under the age of 50. So young patients are more likely to present through the emergency department with symptoms or an acute problem, as my friend did. It's also not even ethnically across the country. For Pacific Island patients with colorectal cancer, 45% of them present to the emergency department rather than coming through general practice. And for Maori, that figures 35%. So there is a huge difference across the spectrum. We recently did a study nationally looking at all of the DHBs and looking at some quality indicators. And this was, this was published on the ministry website in March of this year. This is a funnel plot. Now, some of you will have seen a funnel plot. I'll just briefly explain it. So along the x-axis are the number of patients with colon cancer or colorectal cancer over the four-year period that this was done. On the y-axis is the percentage, in this case, the percentage of patients who presented through an emergency department. This varied from Canterbury in the bottom right-hand corner with, with only 15% of their colorectal cancer coming through the the um, emergency department, to counties Manukau and Auckland, where well over 30% of the, those with colorectal cancer presented through the emergency department. So there's a huge difference across that. The, the central line is the country median of 26%, and the two lines show two standard deviations and three standard deviations from that. So we did that for several indicators, but I'm just going to talk about that, that one in this particular case. The references at the bottom if you want to look up the whole uh, report. So does that mean that colorectal cancer is common in young people? No, it doesn't. This is a, a list of the rates of colorectal cancer in New Zealand by age. It's a few years out of date, but it's still going to be pretty accurate. So for the age group of my friend, 30 to 34, every year there are basically five people out of every 100,000 who would get colorectal cancer, meaning the risk of an individual over the next five years, if they're between 30 and 34, is less than one in a thousand. But it still happens. This is a study that came out in The Lancet this year. And what it does is to compare seven high income countries and look at the the changes in the incidence of colorectal cancer by age. The top line of graphs is looking at colon cancer. The bottom line of graphs is looking at rectal cancer. New Zealand is shown along with Denmark, Australia, Ireland, UK, Norway, and Canada. In the age 20 to 29, there's not been much change on an annual basis for New Zealand patients with colon and rectal cancer, perhaps a little fewer, but there are very few patients in that group. In the age 30 to 39, however, we have the biggest rate of change, the greatest increase in the percentage of patients presenting with colorectal cancer in that age group. We don't know why. 
but at the moment, more than uh, there's a more than seven percent increase in colorectal cancer in the 30 to 39 group in New Zealand every year. We don't see the same in the age 40 to 49 and and for older age groups. There's a lot of discussion internationally what this means, and we don't know as yet. But what it tells us is we do need to be more alert for the younger patient who may well end up with a with a colorectal cancer when we don't really expect it. There's something, there are different things about these cancers also. What this graph, uh, what this table shows you is where the cancers are in the patients in whom it occurs early. So if we look at the whole population, about half of the cancers occur on the right side and about half occur in the left side and the rectum. In these younger patients, 80% approximately are occurring in the left side and rectum. And in some studies, half of the cancers are actually in the rectum. The symptoms are a bit different too in the younger age group, in that rectal bleeding and abdominal pain are the commonest causes, the commonest uh, pre presenting symptoms in this age group. This slide is to remind you that when you have a patient with symptoms relating to the bowel, particularly if they have bleeding, they should have a rectal exam. And if they are under the age of 50, that is even more important because the risk of them having a rectal cancer is higher than the rest of the population. So there's a reasonable chance that if you don't do it, you'll actually miss a rectal cancer that you could have identified at that point. So that's patients that present acutely. I'm gonna talk a little bit about symptomatic patients now. This is my second patient. She's a 74 year old woman who presented actually with a new onset of shortness of breath climbing the hill. She'd previously been well, she'd never had any heart problems. She had no chest pain, no abdominal pain. She was free of medication. She was a perfect patient really, 74 year old. She'd previously had a, a, a lap cholecystectomy she lived with a spouse. She was not drinking, not eating, um, not drinking alcohol, not smoking, and had no family history. Her GP examined her. They noted she had pale conjunctiva, heart rate of 85, blood pressure 140 on 90, nothing to find on abdominal examination, but she had a hemoglobin of 78 which was microcytic and a ferritin of 14 with normal liver function tests. This GP did exactly the right thing. She was referred on for gastroscopy and colonoscopy. On her colonoscopy, she had an ascending colon carcinoma. And on her CT scan, you could see the cancer and fortunately, she had no evidence of any metastases elsewhere. Interestingly, just today, I had a 65 year old patient, my first patient I saw this morning, who also had had a routine blood test, which showed a hemoglobin of 115, a ferritin of four, and he was referred for gastroscopy and colonoscopy and had an almost identical cancer in the cecum completely asymptomatic otherwise. The GP was onto it and the patient was diagnosed within two months of, of getting the blood test initially that showed he was anemic. So this particular patient had a preoperative iron infusion, a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy. She did well. She was discharged on day four. Histology showed a, a T3, meaning the tumor was through the bowel wall but hadn't invaded anything else. M0, no lymph nodes involved, M0, no metastases, and it was well differentiated. She has an 80 to 85% chance of being cured of her cancer with that operation. What will happen with her? She will have another CT scan done at one to two years. She will have a colonoscopy about three years down the track, and she'll have a CEA performed every three to six months as long as she's fit enough to have something done if we identify anything. 
So what are the important symptoms that might make you be make you concerned that the patient might have bowel cancer? There are three main symptoms you need to be aware of. PR bleeding, which would be the commonest. Iron deficiency anemia, as the patients I've told you about had. And changes of bowel habit towards being looser and more frequent. I would have to say that constipation as a sing single symptom, I think has never been an indication that has, I've identified a, a colorectal cancer on during colonoscopy. So it is a very low yield as a single symptom for doing a colonoscopy. But these, these symptoms do have a higher yield. Other symptoms that you should be aware of, abdominal pain as our first patient had, and weight loss. Unfortunately, one of the problems with colorectal cancer is that a single symptom only has a positive predictive value of 5% or less for the diagnosis of colorectal cancer. So the patient who comes through your door, who's got PR bleeding, there's about a one in 20 chance at best or at worst that this patient has or this person has colorectal cancer. So in terms of criteria for deciding who needs a colonoscopy, really we need a combination of symptoms to help us understand exactly what the risk is. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the referral criteria for direct access for colonoscopy that are working across the country. So these are national referral criteria. And if a patient meets these criteria, they don't need to see a specialist. They can go straight to having a colonoscopy. This doesn't mean this is, these are the only indications for colonoscopy. These are the criteria that the GP can access so that they can be um, confident that that patient will be eligible to have a colonoscopy. I'll, talk, I'll go through them in detail. But what you need to know are the essentials you need to put in your referral when you're wanting a patient to be assessed. Unless all the details are there, it's very hard to know whether that patient meets the criteria. I'll run through them quickly for you. If the patient's had bleeding, we'd like to know the character of the bleeding. Is it just on the paper? Is it bright red? Is it dark red? The quantity of the bleeding, the length of history, and where the previous treatment has been tried. For, bowel, for change in bowel habit, we want to know what sort of change in bowel habit. Sometimes the referral will just say change in bowel habit. And if it's they've just become constipated, that's quite different from they're now actually having more frequent stools and it's looser. The length of history, the treatment given. And then the usual things we'd want to know. The past medical and surgical history, associated things that I talked about, pain, weight loss, and if they've got PR bleeding, whether there's an anal lump or whether there's prolapse, Family history, I'm going to talk about a little later in detail, but family history is essential if you're referring a patient who you want to be assessed for colonoscopy or with the, with the, the um, concern they may have colorectal cancer. We want to know what they're on. We want you to examine the patient. We want to know, is there an abdominal finding? Do they have a lump? We want to know if there's anything in the anal area. I'll talk about what to look for. And we want to know, have you done a rectal exam and can you feel anything in the rectum? And I'll show you in a minute why we want to know that. And we want to know, have you done a hemoglobin and have you done a ferritin? Because if that's the jackpot, if they've got both of those, they will come straight to colonoscopy. So there are two different types of criteria. There are urgent criteria and we, re we would require the patient to have their colonoscopy within two weeks of referral. So that is fast. I'll show you how well we're doing at that a bit later. So there are three criteria for, for there are three urgent criteria for colonoscopy within two weeks. The first is a known or suspected colorectal cancer. So this might be on imaging. The patient may have had a, a CT, for instance, and it looks like there's a cancer there. There may be something you can feel rectally. So you think this is a cancer. Um, you may have put a scope in and seen something that looks like a cancer. All of those patients should immediately 
be referred for an urgent colonoscopy, which would be done preoperatively along with a biopsy to ensure this is a cancer. The next group are patients with unexplained rectal bleeding. There's something in the criteria which I will explain in a moment. Benign anal causes treated or excluded. I'll tell you how to do that with iron deficiency anemia. So you've got bleeding rectally, unexplained, iron deficiency anemia, any age, they should have a colonoscopy. The third is altered bowel habit, the looser, more frequent type, for greater than six weeks, plus unexplained bleeding, and aged greater than or equal to 50. So there's the three urgent criteria. <clears throat> the next group, we require their colonoscopy to be done. All our, our target is for their colonoscopy to be done within six weeks. This one we're not doing quite so well nationally, but I'll show you what, how that is. So the first is altered bowel habit, again, looser, more frequent for more than six weeks and aged over 50, 50 or over. Second, altered bowel habit, looser or more frequent for six weeks duration with unexplained bleeding aged 40 to 50. Third, unexplained rectal bleeding, same again, aged greater than or equal to 50. The fourth, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, hemoglobin below the um, reference range and also a low ferritin. There are some provisos on that so that you do need to, uh, in, in premenopausal women, you need to take a history of their menstrual bleeding and so on. Uh, the next one is, deals with family history. So there's the New Zealand guidelines, category two and category three families. I will tell you exactly what category two and category three are in a minute. Number six, suspected or suspected or assessment of inflammatory bowel disease. Now, often those patients would be sent for a, a first specialist appointment rather than going straight for a colonoscopy. So it would depend on the setting with those patients. And then a patient who's had an image that shows there's a polyp which is greater than five millimeters, and they will need to have a polypectomy. So they will get a colonoscopy as well. So those, those criteria, are the criteria that you can confidently use and know your patient will get a colonoscopy, either within two weeks or hopefully within six weeks. We're doing better at the two weeks than the six weeks nationally. What does benign anal causes excluded mean or treated? So benign anal causes is identified as hemorrhoids, anal fissure, anal fistula, inflammatory bowel disease, radiation proctitis, mucosal or full thickness rectal prolapse. So if you examine the patient, you do a proctoscopy and they have none of those, then you can safely say you've excluded them. If you find one of those, then you may need to refer the patient for that or begin treatment for that condition. Here they are. So I, I can't actually get you to respond, I don't think, to what they are, but perhaps you don't want to. <laughs> the top two, uh, patients with hemorrhoids, fourth degree hemorrhoids on the right. The lower picture is a chronic anal fissure. These are usually posterior, usually associated with a small skin tag and may be so painful it's difficult to examine the patient. The top left hand picture is a perianal abscess. The top right hand picture is a fistula in ano, and the lower picture is a rectal prolapse, complete rectal prolapse. So what do you do if you're worried about a patient, they've come with symptoms, and they don't meet the criteria for direct access to colonoscopy or colonography? Well, you have two main options. The first, if you're very concerned about the patient, is to refer for an FSA with either a general surgeon, if you think it's likely that it's a general surgical problem, or a gastroenterologist. So these are the patients whose symptoms are distressing, they need some treatment and you can't do it in the general practice. The other approach you can take is to treat or monitor the patient with safety netting. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about safety netting. So, if you, find, if you examine the patient and find the patient has a fissure, 
then you should start treatment. Stool softness, pain relief, GTN ointment, and review the patient in about six weeks, because it takes about that long to get relief and ensure that the patient is getting better. If they've got hemorrhoids, then we'd start them on oral fiber, and you can easily start a short course of a hemorrhoidal cream or suppository, and again, assess them in six to eight weeks. If they've got a fistula, then they should just be directly referred for an F FSA, because that's a surgical condition, and a surgeon will look after it, and actually will rub his hands with glee, we've got something that we know what to do with. So there are lots of things to, to think about when you're deciding how, what, how can I safely manage this, this person? How can I ensure I don't miss something? So you have to think about what your practice management system, what can you, uh, I don't understand your dashboards, but there are ways for you to actually give yourselves reminders to organize that patients will be followed up. You need to look at you know, what's realistic for you to do in your workload and your time pressure. And, and in your particular way of working. You need to think carefully about, you know, is this a patient I can be confident will come back if they're not better? Because if you can't be confident of that, then you need to think of another way of safety netting them that is a bit more secure so that you can follow them up. The patient's understanding of the situation, how well it's been communicated to them, to them. Do they know what the risk is? Do they understand the uncertainty they're in? How likely is it the patient will come back? Aspects that may increase vulnerability, e.g. the patient is disabled in some way. Your own concern, does this really look like this might be a problem? Then you may want to step up the safety netting for that, that person. The other things that you need to do is ensure that you document this very well. Because often the person who sees this, the, the doctor who sees this person next is not you. And so you need to make it clear, what have you done? What are you concerned about? And why you're bringing them back? I work a lot with John McManaman. Many of you will know John from, from Whanganui. He said, these are the quality, what quality professional care looks like. Maintaining a high index of suspicion, monitoring to ensure follow-up isn't missed, Considering FSA options where direct access is not met. We've talked about that. Talking in your peer review meetings about patients that you're concerned about. Recognizing that patients who reattend with symptoms actually have an increased risk of having some pathology. Learning to communicate uncertainty with patients. And we have to do that often, don't we? And engaging the patient in the decision-making of how you're going to safety net in their particular case. So that's managing symptoms. The next group of presentations is those who come, those who are diagnosed during surveillance. This is another patient of mine. I met her when she was 40. She'd had 10 years of ulcerative colitis and sclerosing cholangitis. She was having two yearly colonoscopy because she had active ulcerative colitis and she had an escalating abdominal pain despite having steroids, azathioprine and pentaser. She had a colonoscopy that showed active inflammation in the whole colon and a stricture in the ascending colon. We couldn't get through to the cecum. I performed a total colectomy, removing all her colon and bringing out an ileostomy with the plan to go back once she was better to take out the rectum and make an ileoanal pouch. I went on holiday. I remember getting a phone call to say the histology has come back. That's an adenocarcinoma in this young woman's colon. It was a node positive. There was a single node that was positive in her case. So she then went on to have chemotherapy for six months before I could do the next stage to make her ileal pouch and join it on. She's now seven years down the track. She's had no recurrence from that. Unfortunately, her sclerosing cholangitis is still giving her a significant problem. So what's surveillance about? Surveillance is repeatedly 
performing a colonoscopy on those patients who are at an increased risk of developing colorectal cancer. And it involves patients with IBD, like my patients, patients with a strong family history of colorectal cancer, patients with a known syndrome. I was going to ask what, what's the uh, inherited pattern in the, in the picture I've given you, but I don't think we can do that. No. no. Okay. okay. So it's, it's an autosomal dominant pattern I'm showing you. And both Lynch syndrome or HNPCC, some of you remember that, that's hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, and FAP, familial adenomatosis polypi, both of these are autosomal dominant conditions. So that means half of the children will develop it of the adults. And the penetrance is high. So it means if we identify the patient as carrying the gene or at risk of carrying the gene, then we will want to do scopes on them frequently, usually every one to two years. And the other group for surveillance is the people with a personal history of colorectal cancer or a personal family history of multiple polyps. That's not just two or three polyps, that's patients with 10, 20, 30 polyps that tend to fit into a, uh, a polyp syndrome. As you can see in the picture at the bottom. So inflammatory bowel disease, disease. These patients begin to develop bowel cancer after about eight to 10 years following the diagnosis. But the frequency of surveillance in this group varies depending on the extent of the bowel that's involved, the activity of the disease in the colon, and the presence of primary sclerosing cholangitis. In fact, most of the patients who've got inflammatory bowel disease who develop cancer will also have PSC. The graph I've got there shows you the increase in risk over time. So by the time you've had extensive colitis for 30 years, you have a 20% chance of, having a, of developing a colorectal cancer. So that's why this group, it's important to provide surveillance to. The next group for surveillance is those with a strong family history. And I said I'd talk about the category one, two, and three. So category one is at a slight increased risk of colorectal cancer. You have one uh, first degree relative with colorectal cancer at the age of 55 or more. The increase is slight. We don't offer surveillance for those patients, but we would suggest if that they develop lower GI symptoms, they should be investigated early. Category two are, are people with a moderate increased risk of colorectal cancer. So if one first degree relative has got colorectal cancer diagnosed under the age of 55, you're a category two. If two first degree relatives on the same side of the family are diagnosed with colorectal cancer at any age, you're a category two. And in these, this group, we would offer colonoscopy every five years and we'd start at 10 years younger than the youngest person in the family who's had a colorectal cancer or at the age of 50, whichever is younger. So if someone's had a cancer at 45, we would start colonoscopy at 35 in category twos. Just to remind you what a first and second degree relative is. First degree is mum and dad, brothers and sisters and children. Second degree is grandparents, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, and grandchildren, I guess. But it's unlikely they're gonna get bowel cancer before you. So just as you think about how that works, we'll go to category three now. So category three are, are people with a really potentially high risk of colorectal cancer. So those I've talked about, so FAP, HNPCC, and other familial colorectal cancer syndromes. And in New Zealand, we have one of the highest rates of another syndrome called serrated polyposis syndrome. And we have quite a big cohort across New Zealand. These patients can develop colorectal cancers quite early. So it's important if you have patients who are getting multiple serrated polyps on their colonoscopies that these patients get referred 
to either a, a bowel cancer specialist or the New Zealand Familial Gastrointestinal Cancer Registry. That's the first group. The second, people with one first degree relative plus two or more first or second degree relatives are all on the same side of the family with colorectal cancer at any age. So that means three or more, one of, at least one of whom is a first degree relative. There are several other combinations of multiple first and degree, second degree relatives, which you won't remember, but they're all in the document at the bottom, which tells you who is at increased risk of colorectal cancer. The next group is a, uh, if you have a personal or first degree relative with multiple colonic polyps, as in the picture. And for those, the, the surveillance is tailored to what actually they have. So for some people, it will be a yearly colonoscopy. For others, it might be two yearly or five yearly. And so it's important they get referred to someone who's dealing with these patients frequently. This is the um, Ministry of Health uh, guideline on surveillance for people with increased colorectal cancer risk. You can click on that. It's very simple to, to read. And if you, uh, you won't remember it all, but it's easy for you to, to uh, have a look at when you need to. Finally, I'm gonna talk a bit about bowel cancer screening and my thanks to um, Sue Perry, who's the clinical director of, of the bowel screening program for these slides, because these are very up to date. They, they were sort of within the last week, they've been updated with where we're at. So the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program has been underway now for two and a half years and is rolling out. And it's based on a fecal occult blood test. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So it's free. We're screening people between the age of 60 and 74, and we're using a fecal immunochemical test. So this is a bit different from the old GUIAC test. It doesn't require any dietary uh, restrictions. It only requires a single test to be done, and it's more sensitive. Um, people are individually invited and they're identified by their uh, PHO data and the NHI and they're invited every two years from the age of 60 to 74. The priority populations are Maori, Pacific and those residing in DEP 9 and 10 areas and there are particular things in place to try and improve their participation. So the screening program started in July of 2017, and so the first screening round was completed in this year in July in Hutt and Wairarapa, the two first um, DHBs off the block. Half of the DHBs in the country are now have now rolled out um, screening, and I think you recognise the people cutting the cake as halfway through. This is the rollout dates, or at least provisional rollout dates, for the other 10 DHBs. So by the middle of 2021, we expect the whole of New Zealand to be included in the screening program. This is a snapshot of the screening program up to the 26th of November of this year. So 350,000 kits sent, about 200,000 kits returned, 7,500 positive results, nearly 6,000 colonoscopies performed, 440 cancers detected, and a third of those are stage one. In the general population of symptomatic patients, about 10 to 15% at best are stage one. Another 30% in the screening program are stage two, meaning that about 65%, in about 65% of the screened patients who have a cancer, they'll be cured from their cancer by surgery alone. So a much better situation than for the symptomatic patients. So how are we doing? The target is to get 60% of patients participating, and that 60% should be for all 
ethnic groups. What we see is that the overall for all participant participation rate is 63% for the country. For Maori, it's 58.4%, which is almost there. When we started the pilot program, the Maori participation rate was less than 45%. So there's a lot of effort being going into improving Maori participation rate. The group we're struggling with the most is actually Pacific Island participants. And there are several new things that we're trying to try and improve that. At present, for, for Pacific individuals, it's only 44% participation. This talks a little bit, a bit about what we're trying to do to improve participation. So we're involved with both Maori and Pacific networks, and I've been involved in meetings with them. For Pacific and Maori participants who do not respond to their first invitation, they will get up to three phone calls from someone of their own ethnicity to encourage them to be involved. In the county's Manukau DHB, which has the highest proportion of Pacific, we are in the process of arranging drop-off of the sample to the lab rather than posting it, because this is seen as a barrier for both Maori and Pacific Island people. The kit has been redesigned and more postcode languages have been included with it. So we're hoping we can get all of the groups up to 60%. So how well is the screening program working? The positivity rate across the country is 4.2%. So of 100 people who return the kit, 4.2 are positive. 90% of those have their colonoscopy within the program. And I want to encourage you, if you have a patient who has a positive test, to encourage them to have their colonoscopy within their DHB. It will be performed in a timely time, manner and the collection of data is much more complete than if they go and have their colonoscopy in private and, and they fall off the radar in a sense from the, the screening program. So 8% of the patients who have a colonoscopy will have a cancer. 25% of the patients who have a colonoscopy will have an advanced adenoma. So that means an adenoma that has already grown towards a cancer, although it's not yet become one, and about 60% will have an adenoma. So a very large proportion of the patients with a positive test have got a finding when they have a colonoscopy. So what's happening with DHB colonoscopy delivery? So this is just the last five years. If we look month by month from 2015, somewhere around 2,500 to 3,000 patients a month were getting a colonoscopy nationally. It is now up to 5,000 patients a month getting a colonoscopy annually. If you look at the different colors, at the very bottom is purple, which is the screening colonoscopies. The next group is blue, is the surveillance colonoscopies. The next group in green is the symptomatic colonoscopies. And the top group in red or purple, I mean, a red or orange, is the urgent colonoscopies. You can see all of those groups have increased not just the screening group at the bottom. So what's happened with the introduction of screening is that people are becoming more aware of bowel cancer and more patients are being referred and more patients are being scoped. How are we getting on in terms of wait time indicators? So this means if a patient meets the criteria for an urgent colonoscopy, how often are they getting that colonoscopy within two weeks? That's the red line at the top. And this is national data. So at present, about 93% of patients who are, who are referred for an urgent colonoscopy get their colonoscopy within two weeks. I said earlier we're not doing so well with the symptomatic patients, but still 56% of patients with symptoms that meet the criteria are getting that within six weeks. I know that five years ago we were nowhere near that. And the surveillance patients are running pretty close to the patients with symptoms of a non-urgent type. I've just got two patients I want to tell you, ask you about and get you to respond to. So you're going to need to be ready to, to respond to a poll now. This is the first patient. It's a 35-year-old man. 
He's got anal pain and bright red bleeding for a week. Again, with constipation, he looks well. He's got a tender anus that you can't examine. What are you gonna do next? Okay, Helen, set up the pole. All right. So you choose between these five. How many have you got now? All right, so we're up to 70%. So last couple of seconds. You've got to bring the, next, bring the next patient in now, so you better make a decision. Yeah. <laughs> the queue's waiting. Well done, everyone. Okay. So if I close this, Paul, will we get the percentages coming up? Yeah. Okay. So we'll close that, and we've got the percentages here, Liam. Okay. So 10% went for one. 1% 1 went for two. 7% went for three. A hefty 70% went for four, and 12% went for five. So this patient almost certainly has got an acute anal fissure. And so the treatment for that is pain relief, stool softener, lactulose, and local anaesthetic jelly. And that's the first line for these patients. And if it's only a week, they've only had pain for a week, it's very likely that this is going to settle without having to do anything else. I think sending the patient to APU is probably over overacting in this one. The problem with using codeine is it will make the patient more constipated and so things will be worse. Injecting local anaesthetic around the anal canal and re-examining would be a bit sporting, I would say. And you wouldn't get an urgent colonoscopy for that. Occasionally, there are patients with an acute fissure who have so much pain that we need to do an examination under anaesthetic. But usually, we would try and treat them with conservative measures as in, in four to start with. OK, let's try the next one. <clears throat> OK, so the next case you've got here. So this is a 65-year-old man who presents with a fall and dizziness. He's had five large bowel motions with blood in 24 hours, and he looks pale. He's got a pulse rate of 96, blood pressure of 90 on 60. Abdominal exam is, is nothing to find, really. It's normal. What are you going to do for this patient? So your options are call the ambulance and send to the hospital emergency department, arrange for a hemoglobin and start iron tablets, stool softener, or refer for urgent colonoscopy. You've got a minute to think about it. <laughs> Thank you everyone for voting. It, it helps the discussion and it's really nice to go through the different options and see where we all sit. Oh, so we're getting a good amount of people voting early this time. There's some decisive <laughs> people out there about this patient. All right, last few people. How many voted now? We've got 75% 75, 75 have voted. Okay. <clears throat> so last couple of seconds, everyone. Okay. So this... Uh, You've got your percentages. Uh, okay, so there's the percentages. So for one, the vast majority of you went for one. Call the ambulance and send to the hospital emergency department. 83%. 6% arrange haemoglobin and start iron tablets, 1% stool softener, and 10% refer for urgent colonoscopy. So this patient has got what's called a massive GI bleed, and so does need urgent treatment. Um, the commonest cause of this is a diverticular bleed, actually, rather than a bowel cancer. Sometimes we see it with angiodysplasia as well of the colon. That's a very small, if you like, a uh, a vascular anomaly in the in the lining of the bowel that bleeds. Almost always, these will stop, but the patient does need to be admitted to hospital. So number number one is the right answer for this: call the ambulance, get them into hospital. They're likely to need a transfusion. They may stop bleeding, but they may need surgery, or they may need um, angiography and embolization of the of the of the area that's bleeding. Right, okay. we're now up to questions. Right, so we we do. Well, that was a, that was a that was a real fly through colorectal cancer. I'm sure there's lots of questions you want to want to uh, answer, and I will um, 
endeavour to answer your questions. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, yeah, the, we have had a few questions come in during the session, which I thought would be I didn't stop long enough to no, ask Oh, well, no, you, you answered a few as they came along, which <clears> was great. Um, one, one question, you talked about the categories with the um, relatives and the family history. Um, there is a question around someone who has a de novo colon cancer age 55 or less, so category mm. two. Um, what other tests would you consider? So obviously there's a referral for a colonoscopy. Would you, what te blood tests, would you consider genetic screening? I know that you do automatically for the category three, but would you do that for a category two? Uh, if that, that would depend on the, uh, the number of people in the family. If there's just one person mm -hmm. under the age of 55, we would normally test the cancer. So we would do, uh, do mismatch repair gene analysis of the cancer itself. And if we identified that there was a, uh, one of the mismatch repair proteins was missing in the cancer, then we would look at doing a gene test. But we wouldn't do a gene test without knowing whether there was one of those things, one of those uh, abnormalities going on. And other than a blood form, is there any other blood test that you'd be expecting? So you'd be looking in a, in a, So this is an asymptomatic relative. Of, Single era. No, I, there, yeah. there, there wouldn't be. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, unless they've got bleeding, in which case they still need a colonoscopy. Yeah. yeah. So that, so that's a category two surveillance colonoscopy, and so they would not just get it once; they'd get a colonoscopy starting from the age of forty-five. Mm -hmm and every five years, unless, of course, there were multiple polyps found and they may have more frequent colonoscopies in that case. Yeah, they may increase the category based on their, yeah. their own findings. And another member in the family may develop a cancer, and so then it you know it changes their, their standing in terms of category. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the next question, do you expect GPs to be performing proctoscopy in order to rule out benign causes of rectal bleeding? Um, it's not something where generally taught in general okay. practice training. Okay, I know, yeah, and I, I know there's a, a, quite a few older GPs who are, who are um, comfortable doing proctoscopy, and there are a lot of other GPs who, who just don't do mm. proctoscopy. Mm. So I wouldn't expect you to do proctoscopy if you are not, don't feel like you're trained or would be able to confidently say no there aren't or yes there are hemorrhoids for instance if you do a, a proctoscopy. I don't think you can adequately exclude hemorrhoids without a proctoscopy over because you can have internal hemorrhoids that bleed that externally look pretty normal and a rectal examination is unlikely to feel them unless they're thrombosed. So um, that is that is a problem in terms of you being able to say, you know, there isn't any benign cause present. But if you in your letter state that this is what I've actually done and I've not found anything with that, then you're a long way down the track for us saying, well, either you need to be seen by someone who can do a proctoscopy and manage that, or you've had enough and you should have a, a, a colonoscopy. Are there courses that people can learn proctoscopy? Is there, a, is there a, the ability to go and get practice within it? Um, we do teach it to medical students. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of a course for GPs, but if it was a felt need, we would we could easily arrange that, actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be very happy to teach people to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't a difficult skill. Um, it would be worthwhile for this to involve not just how to do it but perhaps do a clinic a colorectal clinic where you see mm. different conditions at the same time mm. wonderful that was another another question that came up there you know can we sit in clinics so, yeah yeah you know, I, I would welcome people to come to yeah. to my clinic yeah wonderful uh about with regards to screening are GPs or could GPs be informed if our patients don't complete screening? Yes. Yes. And I can't. I can't answer exactly how that works, but there may be some GPs who can answer that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it is my understanding that GPs are informed if their patients have not, if they've if they've been invited and have not participated. 
and I think some of the um, management systems have the ability to have a red flag so the patient when the patient comes they can be asked about whether they've done their colonoscopy uh, their uh, their uh, fit or fecal immunochemical test or not and encourage them to do so okay. yeah there's a few questions um, with regards to the screening and the age that it starts uh, people have commented that other countries start screening from the earlier age bracket mm. Uh, and there has been a couple of comments around um, why we are unable to order fit tests for screening in a young, younger age bracket if we have a concern or would like to for a particular patient. Um, do you have a comment to make on that? Okay, so the first question was... Um, why is New Zealand screening from why, start, why are we starting yeah. at Why are we starting at 60? Uh, we're starting at 60 because we don't have the capacity at present to start at 50. And the participation rate and the hit rate is higher from 60 to 74 than from 50 to 59. Mm. Uh, in fact, most countries start with a narrower age range and increase it as their capacity for the colonoscopy increases. So. Um, what we do know is that starting at 60 will identify, if we're looking at, at the different ethnic groups, um, non-Maori, non-Pacific will have most of their cancers after the age of 60. What we have discovered, however, is that for Maori and Pacific, by the time they reach 60, 60% 60 of their cancers have already occurred. Mm -hmm. So we are disproportionately disadvantaging Maori and Pacific having the, the, the range starting at 60 for them. So there is, there is discussion at present around how we manage that. And that may mean that we progressively reduce the age range starting with Maori and Pacific to 50 that is still a work in progress, but I, I would suspect in two to three years that will have, that will be happening. Mm -hmm. The next question was around, why can't we just use the FIT test on whoever we like? Well, I guess in that younger age group, if we are concerned. Yeah. So um, there are private, um, there is private access to FIT testing. Our concern is that using a fit test in a, in a patient who is symptomatic mm -hmm. is not the right test. And secondly, we're concerned about the, the problem of, of the inequity of starting a fit test in a population that we're not really geared to provide the colonoscopy follow-up for. So it is, um, I guess, a, a, a public health and equity issue that we're, we're struggling with and a resource issue, to be, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, however, what's happening in the UK at the moment, and we're watching this carefully. There is a, um, a study going on called the NICE FIT study, where they're taking patients or well, they're taking people presenting with symptoms and testing them with a very sensitive fit test to decide whether or not they should have a colonoscopy. So they, they are, in a sense, trying to exclude patients who don't need a colonoscopy rather than identify more people who do. So it's, it's it is, if you like, a rationing tool to say, okay, of these patients who are symptomatic, who we don't know whether they're the ones who need a colonoscopy. Can we do another step and give them a very sensitive fit test that rules out cancer? That study is still ongoing. I can tell you, I, I actually emailed the author the last couple of days, and basically he's, he said, we have, if we set the fit test at 10, then we have a sensitivity of 90%, so we miss 10% of the cancers. If we set it at 2, 
we have a sensitivity that's a, that's just about you know the tiniest amount of blood you can imagine we have a 96 percent sensitivity but we end up with a much poorer specificity so we end up with a lot more people who don't need a colonoscopy getting a colonoscopy i don't know the long-term answer for this but i suspect there's going to be some way that we manage symptomatic patients better than we do at the moment and i don't think it's very far away and it may involve a fit test actually Okay, and I think that there, there's a question that, that segues from that, which was, would we be able to do the faecal test on premenopausal women with new anemia to rule out bowel blood loss? Um, <clears throat> and that's a, a possibly a similar answer. Yeah, mm. yeah, but they probably need a colonoscopy. Mm. If they've not got menorrhagia and they've got iron deficiency anemia, mm. um, yeah, I'm looking into, into the distance. <laughs> Having a thought. <clears throat> uh, okay, just uh, a, a new question that's come through. Is in the younger age group um, with colorectal cancer, is there any relationship with HPV? Not that we're aware of, okay. but there is a relationship with anal cancer. Yes. And so definitely, I, mean, I didn't talk about anal cancer in my talk, which is obviously a different different subject, but almost all the patients with anal cancer have got HPV, mm. and it's usually HPV 16. Mm. Um, do you have a preference for topical anal preparations, ultraproct versus proctocetal? I don't have a preference, no. and so, but some patients have a preference, and they have a preference of whether they want to have ointment they apply or a, 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 a suppository. So I, I think the thing to watch though is that you don't just keep using that for a long, long time because it does thin the anoderm and so they're more likely to get very thin, irritated skin. So for, as a short as a short burst to try and overcome, you know, an attack of hemorrhoidal symptoms, then that's that's very reasonable. Uh, there have been a couple of questions around the role of doing tumor markers either in symptomatic patients or as screening for bowel cancer? Um, the main tumour marker for colorectal cancer is CEA, and it isn't a screening test. So what C, the problem is uh, a bowel cancer that is just in the bowel wall does not cause the CEA to be elevated. The CEA is actually a marker of tumour outside the portal circulation. So it's actually a, a marker to suggest that maybe this patient's had spread somewhere else. So we use a CEA in the post-operative setting to identify those patients who may have, for instance, a liver metastasis or a lung metastasis that may be resectable, but it's of no value as a, as a screening test for the population. Okay. And in terms of screening, can we use faecal calprotectin? as a screening tool? Not as a screening tool for colorectal cancer. Okay. <laughs> Are there any thoughts that you have on cancer sniffing dogs? Now that's unusual, I haven't heard of this one. Oh no, well yes. yeah, so I have thoughts about cancer sniffing dogs. I, I'd like to meet one, um, <laughs> but <laughs> there is about a study about to happen in New Zealand, yeah. I believe. Yeah. I saw that yesterday. About a year ago, there was some um, some work that looked at, I'd have to say the study wasn't very big, and the study was not looking at a population, it was looking at a selection of patients who are going to have a colonoscopy. The sniffer dogs were pretty good. Mm. So whether sniffer dogs are going to become part of what we use, I don't know. We're not there yet. I, mean, I think it's very interesting, but I think not much more than interesting yet. Mm. Um, so I'll be interested to see what happens. Watch that space. And I, I mean, think the study they're going to do in New Zealand is sniffing urine rather than stool. The major studies that I've seen were, look, were sniffing stool, but who knows? The dog's nose is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Might be cheaper than. <laughs> we just have to train a lot of dogs, but I don't. I don't know that. It's it's still work a work progress. in progress. Yeah. Uh, what there has been. Um, suggested to GPs that they do a screening annual uh, rectal, digital rectal examination 
Um, so there has been a question about your opinion on this and also on the role of sigmoidoscopy. Okay, so I think a, a, a digital rectal examination yearly looking for a rectal cancer is not a, a really a recommended approach. Um, I'm not sure what the, 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 the rate of rectal examination is recommended for prostate cancer. Um, I know that there are GPs who would do that as part of their overall general examination. I would recommend that. But in terms of, uh, I think in an asymptomatic person looking for a rectal cancer, doing a rectal exam yearly is, is not one of the, the agreed approaches. Mm -hmm. um, flexible sigmoidoscopy as opposed to rigid sigmoid sigmoidoscopy is a screening program that's used in some places. And in the UK, they are at present trialing an initial flexible sigmoidoscopy followed by the, the immunochemical fit test after that. In time, that might be shown to be the best way to go. Um, so certainly there is international evidence for flexible sigmoidoscopy as a route to, to screening. A rigid sigmoidos sigmoidoscope, unfortunately the views are nowhere near as good as the view you get with a flexible scope. And unless you do good prep, you don't see all that much with a mm -hmm. rigid sigmoidoscope. Mm -hmm. Someone's uh, written in responding to our um, discussion about whether we're informed of our patients. Uh, complete the screening or not and they say we are not informed currently if our patients are invited but have not participated. You can check on the patient dashboard when you see them. We also may not get a negative result sent to us as patients can request that their GP is not informed so it may appear they have not done the test when they have. Okay. This um, issue is being addressed with the redesign of the kits. Okay. According to this Okay that, that's great thank you for that thank whoever, you. whoever you are. Thank you Jim. Um, <clears throat> Janet, is it? Um, yes. Janet. Oh, I think I know who Janet yes. is. <laughs> uh, there is a question here about the current cutoff for the fit testing of 200. Yep. Uh, and this person encourages their patients to apply to the screening program for the actual number. And if it's over 140, then they recommend that their patient has a private investigation. They're concerned about the level of 200. Being too high? Being too high. Okay. Um, there are some patients who have a colorectal cancer with a fit test under 200. There are some who have a colorectal cancer with a fit test under 75. The number gets less the lower you get, but there isn't a number you can say this is the right cutoff point. Mm. The problem with the fit test, the lower you go, the more false mm. positives you're going to get. So the more colonoscopies that are negative you need to do. And the figure of, uh, I mean, I think the figure of 140 seem, doesn't, I don't see the rationale for that. But um, so I wouldn't recommend so, saying, okay, well, we'll have our own cutoff point, which will be something different from the, from the national one. Okay, and there's a couple of questions around whether blood from occult hemorrhoids would give a positive fit test and whether that's a concern. Uh, certainly if someone has hemorrhoids that are bleeding, it would give a positive test. Yes, it would. Okay. Uh, how sensitive, very quickly, how sensitive is a CT colonography compared to a colonoscopy? Or is that it, is, it is almost as sensitive. Now, the, the, the area it's, it loses its sensitivity is in the polyp under five millimeters in size, and those are very rarely of significant pathology. So it's a good test, and we're happy with that test. There are some things that we don't like using it for. For instance, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, because you can't take a biopsy while you're doing it. And patients with multiple polyps, obviously, there's not a lot of point in doing a, a CTC. But in, particularly in older patients who are less frail, who are, who are more frail and would be more difficult to do a colonoscopy, it's a great test to do. So yes, we recommend it. And, and, and as you, if you see the recommendations there for both, so mm -hmm. they, they run together. CT colonography and colonoscopy indications basically the same. Wonderful. 
and just very quickly, do you have a comment on the risk of colorectal cancer? Uh, and, and you talked about inflammatory bowel disease, but yes. then you specified ulcerative colitis. Can you comment on Crohn's disease? Uh, it is probably as common with Crohn's disease as well. Okay. Um, often Crohn's disease is not as extensive in the colon, so it, it does depend on the extent of disease. But when you've got pancolitis, the numbers are pretty similar when you get to 20, 30 years down the track. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ian. I think that's all we have time, time for. for today. Oh, it's been great morning. talking to you. Yeah, wonderful talk. I think we've all learned a lot and um, obviously lots of exciting Yeah, there things are lots of things the on the horizon, yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, I'm really excited about our screening getting moving now. So if you can encourage all your patients, particularly the low, low um, decile deprivation groups mm -hmm. and Maori and Pacific to do their test. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.